Just as the United States was the first nation to reach the moon in the 20th century, so too will we be the first nation to return astronauts to the moon in the 21st century. And I'm here on the President's behalf to tell the men and women of the Marshall Space Flight Center and the American people that at the direction of the President of the United States, it is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. And let me be clear, the first woman and the next man on the moon will both be American astronauts launched by American rockets from American soil. The President has directed NASA and Administrator Jim Bridenstine to accomplish this goal by any means necessary. In order to succeed, we must focus on the mission over the means. You must consider every available option and platform to meet our goals, including industry, government, and the entire American space enterprise. History is written by those who dare to dream big and do the impossible. You have given us a charge today, and it is right on time. And I want to say thank you for that vision and the leadership. Um, our agency, NASA, is going to do everything in its power to meet that vision, to meet that deadline. Uh, and you have my full commitment to, to achieving that. And Mr. Vice President, I can tell you, I am confident we can get to that first launch in 2020 for SLS and actually fly a crew capsule around the moon. We will be using the Gateway as a reusable command module to get boots on the moon as soon as possible. 2008 and 2009, NASA made important discoveries, hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the poles of the moon. We want to be able to get to that polar region. We need a reusable command module. We need a command module that can, no kidding, maneuver around the moon. That's what the Gateway is all about. America will once again astonish the world with the heights we reach the wonders we achieve, and we will lead the world in human space exploration once again. Now let's get to work. Well, as I said uh, at the National Space Council, and as everybody here is aware, that was an amazing charge. Uh, and, of course, as Bettina outlined earlier, it has resulted in a lot of questions and a lot of um, discussion. And I will tell you more than anything, it's resulted in a lot of excitement, a level of energy, quite frankly, that I haven't seen in a long time, at least in my short uh, almost 12 months here. But I will tell you, this is what I know throughout history. When this agency is given a task by the President of the United States, and it has also given the resources and the tools this agency can deliver. And what I want to talk about today is how that's going to be achieved. And there's, there's not going to be, at this point, um, the answer is not going to be perfect, uh, but the answer is going to be clear. There is an end state that is possible to achieve, and there is a way to get there. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure I had an opportunity at this point to talk to the NASA family about how important this objective is and really just open the discussion, the dialogue about how we're going to be able to achieve it. So with that, I, I'm going to just go straight to questions, uh, concerns. If people have ideas, I'm open to it. Uh, I have seen <laughs> some of the online questions already. There is no shortage of questions. So if you don't feel like you want to ask, feel free not to. Uh, well, there's no way we're going to get to all of them. Um, but they're being voted on, right? And because they're being voted on, we can kind of rack and stack and characterize what, what is on the highest on people's agenda. And I just want to make sure we have an opportunity to have this discussion early as we begin this process of putting humans on the moon in 2024. So Bettina, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you've got some questions. Yeah. And if, if you're in the audience and you're thinking, um, we're, we're here to you know, have a, an open discussion with the members of the audience as well. Great, thank you, Administrator. There are a ton of questions online. We're gonna to get to one of the top questions we have online, and then we're gonna get headed to the room. Our workforce is not one to be shy, so I'm sure they're ready to ask their questions. So the number one question online is, will the administration and Congress back up this audacious goal with an appropriate influx of funding? 
uh, will the administration and Congress, um, based on what I heard from the Vice President at the National Space Council, he said this was a charge from the President, and he said he has tasked NASA and Administrator Jim Bridenstine to accomplish this task by any means necessary. Uh, I, I heard that loud and clear. He backed it up after that, and he said the mission matters more than the means. To me, that says we're, we're going to need additional means. I don't think anybody can take this level of commitment seriously unless there are additional means. Uh, and so that's, that's what I intend to support as we go forward. Um, we think about the history of this agency. Um, we can accomplish amazing things. Uh, but we also think about the history of the agency, and we, we, we see that in, in history, and I, I know there's a lot of questions about this as well. I've, I've seen the online questions. The idea that from time to time um, in, 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 in the past, we've had an agenda to get to the moon, um, and then the, the, the resources don't materialize and it gets canceled. And then we have another agenda to go to the moon and the resources don't materialize and it gets canceled. I will tell you from my perspective, it is my objective to get the resources necessary to accomplish the objective. It is also my commitment to make sure people understand the history here and that we can have a great ambitious goal, but without the resources it won't be accomplished. Based on the comments that I've heard and the conversations I've had, the commitment from the administration is there. Uh, I can't speak for Congress, of course, uh, but I will tell you I'll be talking to members of Congress about what the, what the plan is. It's also true that before that happens, I'll be working with OMB to make sure that there is broad consensus throughout the entire executive branch before we go to Congress, because what we can't do is be divided as we go forward. And that broad consensus doesn't just include within the administration, it also includes bipartisan support in the House and the Senate. Again, if, if this is a divided task, um, it won't be achievable in the year 2024. So we've got to get that broad consensus. This is an all of America approach. It's a bipartisan kind of effort, and we can't do it one party over another, and we can't do it uh, with divisions within the executive branch. And so my goal is to work with all players, all players, within the executive branch, within the House, and within the Senate to achieve the end state, which is boots on the moon in 2024. Great. With that, we're going to go to questions from the audience. Um, well, oh. Go ahead. OK. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi there. Uh, my name is Patrick Murphy, and I work for the Space Technology Mission Directorate. And so my question is this. Last Wednesday, India held a anti-satellite test. Oh. Now, this test created a cloud of orbital debris that's flying in low Earth orbit. And so when I think of orbital debris that they're tracking, it's the size of my fist, several, several pieces of that. Now, that's potentially of high risk to NASA assets, and more importantly to our NASA astronauts. What's NASA's reaction to that? Thank you. Oh, that's a great question, Patrick. <laughs> and uh, there, there's, um, this is a town hall in and of itself. Uh, it is absolutely true that intentionally creating orbital debris fields is not compatible with human spaceflight. Here's what we know about the most recent direct ascent anti-satellite test that was done by India. We know that we have identified 400 pieces of orbital debris from that one event. That's what's been identified. Now all of that cannot be tracked. What we are tracking right now, objects big enough to track, we're talking about 10 centimeters or bigger, about, about 60 pieces have been tracked. In other words, they've got a tracking number and, and we're able to keep, keep up with where they are. Of those 60, we know that 24 of them are going above the apogee of the International Space Station. That is a terrible, terrible thing to create an event that sends debris in an apogee that goes above the International Space Station. And that kind of activity is not compatible with the future of human space flight that we need to see have happen. We are charged with commercializing low Earth orbit. We are charged with enabling more activities in space than we've ever seen before for the purpose of benefiting the human condition, whether it's pharmaceuticals or printing human organs in 3D to save lives here on Earth, or manufacturing capabilities in space that aren't, you're not able to do in a gravity well. Like, all of those are placed at risk when these kind of events happen. And when one country does it, then other countries feel like they have to do it as well. So, Patrick, I'm with you. 
I get it. I understand it. It's unacceptable. And NASA needs to be very clear about what its impact to us is. Now, we're learning more and more every hour that goes by about this orbital debris field that has been created from this anti-satellite test. Where we were last week with an assessment that comes from NASA experts as well as the Joint Space Operations Center, I guess it's the Combined Space Operations Center now, the CSPOC, was that the risk to the International Space Station was increased by 44%. The risk, and the, I'm talking about small debris impact to the International Space Station, the risk went up 44% over a period of 10 days. So the good thing is it's low enough in Earth orbit that over time this will all dissipate. You go back in time, 2007, direct ascent to anti-satellite test by the Chinese, all of that orbital debris is, not all of it, but a lot of it is still in orbit, and we're still dealing with it. And we're still we as a nation are responsible for doing space situation awareness and space traffic management conjunction analysis for the entire world and we're doing it for free compliments of the taxpayer of the United States of America from an orbital debris field that was created by another country. Why do we do that as a nation? Because it's the right thing to do? Because we want to preserve the space environment? And I know, I know why you asked the question, Patrick, the, the, the Space Technology Mission Directorate you're responsible under Space Policy Directive 3, signed by the President of the United States for the first time in American history for building the technologies and the capabilities ultimately to, to ensure that we can track this kind of debris in the future at a better state than we can right now. With the, the United States Air Force and uh, Strategic Command right now, they've got a lot of different programs in place. The Space Fence Right now, we're able to, to track about 23,000 pieces of orbital debris, things that are 10 centimeters or bigger. With the space fence coming online, we're going to be looking at hundreds of thousands of pieces of orbital debris. Some people say 200,000. Some people say 500,000. Bottom line is we don't know. What we do know is whatever it looks like, it's going to be scary. And what we have to do is we have to get a lot better at figuring out how to reduce uh, the bubbles around each one of those objects in low Earth orbit that could risk, put at risk the International Space Station, so we don't have to constantly be maneuvering the International Space Station. I guess to, the, the point is this. NASA has a role to play here, especially when it comes to protecting the lives of our astronauts. NASA has a role to play here when it talks about the new technology, the new capabilities under Space Policy Directive 3 signed by the President to make sure that our people are safe and that our hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets in low Earth orbit are safe. Um, and we have a role to play with the Commerce Department. Under Space Policy Directive 3, space situation awareness, space traffic management is not going to be done by strategic command anymore. It's going to be done by the Commerce Department, which I think is a great move because this is not just about national security. It's about economic development. Um, how that gets developed, of course, again, that's another town hall. But at the end of the day, we need to be clear with everybody in the world we're the only agency in the federal government that has human lives at stake here. And it is not acceptable for us to allow people to create orbital debris fields that put at risk our people. I, 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 want, it, I want to anchor here because there's probably people here sending tweets and all kinds of things right now based on my comments. Know this. While the risk went up 44%, our astronauts are still safe. The International Space Station is still safe. If we need to maneuver it, we will. The probability of that, I think, is low. But at the end of the day, we have, to, we have to be clear also that these activities are not sustainable or compatible with human spaceflight. So thank you for the question. Again, I, we'll do a whole other town hall about this and, and the, the vision NASA has ultimately for how situation awareness and space traffic management should unfold in the future. Uh, but Patrick, that's a, that's a great, great point. We're going to take one more question from the audience. Hi, Jim Green, NASA Chief Scientist. To go to the moon in five years, we need to focus. So that means a whole series of new things will have to get, will get started. But one of the things that I'm thinking about, of course, would be to narrow in on a location yeah. where we can create an architecture around it, where we can, with CLIPS, have precursors where we can bring in the science community to be, really be able to uh, help make that five-year goal a reality. Yeah. What are your thoughts on how we can do that next? A great, great point. 
and I'm with you 100%. In fact, the vice president said it in his speech. He said that when we go to the moon next time, we're going to the poles of the moon. In fact, the South Pole specifically is what he said. So the reason for that is that's where the resources are. The president's first space policy directive says to go to the moon, go sustainably, go with commercial partners, go with international partners, and he said to utilize the resources of the moon. That resource utilization, that's a new policy for the United States in history. What, what does that mean? Well, we know that there's water ice at the poles of the moon. We know that that water ice is life support, it's air to breathe, it's water to drink, um, and in the future, it could in fact be fuel. It, I mean, it's hydrogen and oxygen, same fuel that powered the space shuttles, same fuel that will power the SLS, and it's abundant in hundreds of millions of tons on the surface of the moon, at the poles specifically. So what we have to do with these, as you identified, the CLPS missions as precursors, we want to get those going very soon. We're not delaying, we're moving out fast. We believe that there are commercial partners out there that can deliver on that. We need to characterize where the best value is for the missions that we do to the surface of the moon. And with CLPS, and in fact, even EM-1, we can actually put things on the surface of the moon to do characterization of where would be the best place to go. The other thing that we need to consider are potentially impactor missions so that we can actually characterize what comes from those impacts on the moon uh, to, to determine you know, where are the volatiles. In other words, where is the, where is the water? Um, so all of that, I think, is important. <laughs> I think it's even more impressive that the vice president declared that's where we're going to go, and we have to deliver on it. And uh, talking to some of the folks that are here in the front row, um, I was asking what, what the complexity, when you talk about orbital physics, the complexity of going to the poles versus going to the equatorial regions, what's the difference? Well, the key is the gateway. If we're going to put humans on the South Pole, we have to have a reusable command module that has more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. In other words, it's got to be maneuverable. And the gateway is our key. And there's a whole host of reasons why the gateway is key to that. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, I, think it's, I think it's possible. It's doable. Um, and the Science Mission Directorate, and I know chief scientist, right? The Science Mission Directorate is going to be critical to helping us characterize and understand where that first human in this century is going to land on the surface of the moon. And I loved how the vice president put it. The next man and the first woman are going to be American astronauts on the moon. Great. We're going to take a question online, reminding everyone that you can go to nasa.gov backslash town hall and submit a question or vote one up. Um, our second most voted question is, isn't this first step of the return to schedule over safety? Been there, done that w with catastrophic results. Your thoughts? I, um, I would not say that it's a return to schedule over safety. I would say it's a return to schedule. Um, safety is paramount for everybody at this agency. It always has been. I, I, as a Navy pilot, I've, I've flown many a mission off an aircraft carrier, and I remember sitting in briefs uh, from you know, different element leads of different strike packages, et cetera, and everybody always says, right before we step to our aircraft, they always say, number one mission today is safety. Actually, no, that's actually not the case. <laughs> if it was, we would all just stay in the ready room and watch CNN. <laughs> uh, so number one mission is not safety. Safety is critical. I think you know, after the CABE report, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, uh, we now understand independent technical authority, and that is strongly in place, and it will make sure that we have a safe return to flight, especially when we talk about going all the way to the moon. All of those elements of safety are currently in place. They, we are keenly focused on safety. We're not going to land boots on the moon in 2024 unless we can get there safely. I mean, if it's not safe, everything else is at risk. So if we're going to land in five years on the surface of the moon, safety has to be paramount, and it will be paramount. This is an agency that understands the history better, better, than, better than anyone else, and we're, we're committed to the safety element. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Oh. Well, while you by, all By the way, <laughs> when I said we stay in the ready room and watch that network, what I meant was we'd watch NASA TV. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Clark, Science Mission Directorate. I have a slightly different question. Um, recently, the FCC decided to auction off certain bandwidths to support the 5G initiative here in this country. 
And from the SMD standpoint, uh, we're very concerned because part of one of the bandwidths is the 23.8 gigahertz frequency that our Earth science researchers use and our NOAA colleagues use uh, for critical microwave sounding data for terrestrial weather forecast. Right. So uh, what I'd like to know is what is the agency doing to address this, what we really feel is an alarming issue at this point? It, yeah, well, yeah, it is. A um, couple of things to, to keep in mind. Number, number one, uh, you, you're absolutely right when it comes to characterizing the water vapor in the atmosphere. We have to have access to that 23.8 gigahertz. What they're auctioning or what they have already auctioned is a frequency range right next to that. Um, the, the concern becomes what is the, what, what is the splash into our frequency range that, that comes from that, the interference, if you will. And there's a whole host of things that go into that. Um, the power out, uh, how many cell towers are going to be placed around the globe, that, or at least throughout our own country. Those cell towers and the power out and all those things that result in interference into our part of the spectrum that is so important to characterizing weather forecasting. Um, you, you, you are correct that um, given what we understand uh, that they're looking at as far as power requirements, we're, we're at risk. Um, and I will characterize it this way. I was in the House of Representatives. Actually, it was before I was in the House of Representatives. I was in the House of Representatives when we passed the appropriation bill to augment Hurricane Sandy, the, the augmentation to the appropriation bill for Hurricane Sandy. And I don't, I think it was something like $40 billion. Um, here's the thing. We missed that, we missed that hurricane making landfall. All of our models made it taking a right hook out to sea. The European model had it hooking and hitting land. How did we miss it? Well, we missed it not because the model was bad, although a lot of people said that. I eventually became chairman of the Environment Subcommittee. We missed it because the data was bad. We didn't have enough data, and we didn't have the best data. The Europeans had better data than we had, and that ultimately resulted in them knowing that that hurricane was going to make landfall. And because of them, we were able to <laughs> evacuate the right people and maybe even not evacuate the wrong people, which also has an economic impact. So my, my point is, um, Steve, I get it. Um, this is a big deal for this agency. It's a big deal for the United States of America. It has a huge economic impact on our country. Uh, it's, it's not just about hurricanes, though. It's also about predicting severe weather events. And the way I characterize it, if this particular frequency band stays as it is with the power requirements or the power allowable that it currently has, um, we're looking at going back to 1978 levels of data. 1978 levels of data. In other words, instead of giving a, a, a seven-day weather forecast, you're going to get a two- or a three-day weather forecast. That has huge economic impact for, to our country. Um, so this is, this is, you know, people say it's, it's, it's earth science, it's weather forecasting. I'll tell you something else that's on my mind. I, I'm in a town hall. This could get me in trouble, but it's the truth. We've got, I, I was the chairman of the Environment Subcommittee in the House of Representatives when JPSS fell behind. JPSS won. Why did that matter? Because Suomi NPP was at the end of its useful life. JPSS was being delayed and delayed and delayed. And if Suomi NPP ceased to operate, we were going to lose 80% of the data that fed into our numerical weather models from the United States of America. And the testimony that I had from NOAA at the time on the Science Committee was that that would put us in a position to miss 25% of the severe storms in the state of, in the state of Oklahoma. 25% of the severe storms. So that was JPSS. Well, what's the primary instrument on JPSS? ATMS, which of course is doing what? It's, it's sounding in the microwave spectrum for the purpose of characterizing water vapor. So the question is, does this country intend to make multi-billion dollar investments into satellite programs for which the flagship instrument is now not going to be able to return its investment? Do we put a hold on these programs? I, I don't know at this point. I've got to work with NOAA. I've got to figure out what's real and what's not real as far as the data that we're going to be able to accumulate once this spectrum is no longer available. But this has huge impact to existing programs already on orbit with tens of billions of dollars worth of investment. It has impact on programs that are underway right now. It has impacts to 
the people in the United States who rely on weather forecasting. It has impact to the people on the East Coast who need to understand where a hurricane is going to make landfall. I get it. Uh, <laughs> NOAA understands. Uh, the Commerce Department understands. They're calling us. So we, we've got to figure out um, how we're going to continue the missions that we've been tasked to accomplish under this kind of new environment. And I, I don't know at this point. I'm going to be honest. We've got to figure it out. But it's a big deal, and it's important, and we're going to continue working on it. The key is, Steve, to your point, what are we doing about it? Dialogue. <laughs> we need to communicate with all parts of the federal government about why this is a challenge and figure out how we're going to deal with it because it's, it's going to have a big impact. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. We're looking at the questions on NASA.gov backslash town hall, and we're seeing a theme, so we're going to combine some. Um, Vice President Mike Penn said, um, NASA must transform itself into a leaner, more accountable, and more agile organization. He also said, if NASA is not currently capable of landing American astronauts on the moon in five years, we need to change the organization, not the mission. What does this mean? Do you think NASA will meet the 2024 deadline? And how specifically can NASA be reformed to meet these ambitious goals? The answer is, do I believe it's gonna, we're going to meet the deadline? Absolutely. And that, 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 that's a point of emphasis. Because um, here you have an administration that declared we were going to land humans on the surface of the moon during the time which that administration might potentially still be in office. That's a very serious declaration. Even if you go back to John F. Kennedy's day, uh, he said within, by the end of the decade, which guaranteed he would not be in office uh, by the end of the decade. That's a 10-year horizon. So this is, a, this, is, this is a very serious proposal to make it happen and to get it done. I hear the comment all the time about Lucy and the football. Lucy and the football. I, I've heard it since I've been here probably, I don't know, a couple of hundred times. This is not Lucy and the football. <laughs> In the executive branch, people are very serious. We're going to the moon, and we're going fast, and we're going with international and commercial partners, with international and commercial partners. So I, I don't want to discount how important that question is. Do I believe it's possible? Absolutely. Why? Because you're here. You're the ones that are going to make it possible. You're the ones that are going to... This is a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I hope everybody here takes that away. This, this is an opportunity for people in this room and people watching from across the agency to say where you were when you're talking to your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. This opportunity before us is something we haven't had in a very long time, saying we're going to go to the moon and we're going to know within five years. It's never, it's, it's never happened before, but now it has happened. So, yes, we're going to do it. The vice president is correct. If we have to reorganize, we're going to reorganize. And a lot of people are familiar with the new... Moon to Mars Mission Directorate, and that is a part of this initiative, which is, you know, when we talk about operations and we talk about development, those are two very different kind of capabilities. And I don't ever want to say that space flight is somehow normal, but when we talk about operations, we're talking about existing hardware, existing capability, um, and a, a, a cadre of people that are trained and prepared and ready to go do these activities. When we talk about development, we're talking about things that have never been done before. And we're talking about brand new things that require uh, a whole different skill set than operations. Not that there's not a lot of over overlap. I, I, I believe me, there is. But we talk about what we're talking about here is a mission directorate focused on development. But we don't want to call it the development mission directorate because what mission is development? <laughs> it's not a mission. This is the moon to Mars mission directorate. It's, it's focused on ultimately getting us uh, to the moon with an intent to retire risk, prove capability, prove technology, and then reuse as much of that capability and technology for a mission to Mars. That's what the Moon to Mars Mission Directorate is all about, and it's, a little, it's different than human operations, which is now going to be a, a separate mission directorate. As far as um, I think a lot of people heard the Vice President say that we're not committed to any one contractor. That is 100% true as well. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going in 2024. And whatever that takes, the, the vice president said, by direction of the president, that um, any means necessary and that the mission matters more than the means. And we're going to the South Pole. So that's the goal. That's what we're trying to achieve here. And, and uh, not trying, that's what we're going to achieve. And this is a great opportunity for everybody in this room. Great. 
So recently during your workforce message we, that we sent out last week, you mentioned the top lines of a two-week review about commercial op options for the Orion. Can you give us some more details of that the review? Okay, so the, uh, the review of commercial options for the first launch of Orion around the moon. Uh, so good, good question. Um, this could take a little bit of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to put it in a nutshell. Here, here's the thing. The SLS with an Orion crew capsule and a European service module was intended to launch in December of this year, December of 19, with a no later than date of, of June of 2020. Um, that slipped significantly uh, based on a brief that I got from Boeing and others. And since that slipped significantly, and we're trying to, to accelerate, I said, okay, we're going to look at all the options. What is the trade space to put Orion around the moon with the European service module and test it? The goal here is, is to test it. And if we were to do that commercially, then we would still have that first SLS for a launch uh, in the future that could put some kind of habitation module, maybe you know, whatever else might, we, we might want to put in orbit around the moon as part of the gateway. That first SLS would still be available. That was the intent. Now, here's the thing. We looked at those options very carefully over a period of two weeks, and there's a lot of people that got no sleep for two weeks because I tasked them with this. So thank you, number one, for doing that work. Here's what we learned. Number one, a Delta IV Heavy um, is not, it, it cannot launch a, a, an Orion crew capsule with a European service module to orbit. It just doesn't have the throw weight capable of doing that. So I, I asked, what about an ICPS? Can we put an interim cryogenic propulsion stage? Well, actually, no, you can't. Why? Because that weighs it down even more. So it still prevents it from getting to orbit. So then the question was, what about two Delta IV Heavies? Can you launch an ICPS on a Delta IV Heavy and another you know, Delta IV Heavy with the Orion crew capsule and the European service module? The answer is yes, you can launch both of them. The problem is we only have one launch pad on each coast for a Delta IV Heavy. And by the way, we don't have any extra Delta IV Heavy sitting around, so we'd have to steal those rockets from another agency, two of them. So we looked at that and we said, okay, well, is it physically possible if, if we had the support to take rockets from other places? And the answer was yes, it's physically possible. Here's the problem. When you launch one from the East Coast and one from the West Coast, the one on the West Coast can only launch polar because you can't launch it east over the United States from the West Coast. So when you launch a polar orbit, now you have to switch orbits when you're in orbit around the Earth. Which that takes a ton of delta V. And it takes a ton of time. That's the big problem is the time. Because if, if and I don't want to say what that time is, but it's enough time to where you're going to have cryogenic boil off and then you're not going to be able to accomplish the objective anyway. So two delta fours proved to be unworkable. So then we said, what about a Delta IV and a Falcon Heavy? Or, even better, let's pretend the two Delta IVs worked. We don't have any way to do automatic rendezvous and docking. That d capability does not exist in our country except for one solution, which is a Crew Dragon, which we just proved on the International Space Station. So, okay, let's take a Crew Dragon and dock it to the Orion and push it around the moon. We'll launch the Crew Dragon on a, on a Falcon, and we'll launch the Orion and European service module on Delta IV Heavy. Can we do that? Put them both on the pad. By the way, I was for it because the visuals would be beautiful. Can we put both of them on the pad at the same time, launch them an hour and a half apart, one orbit apart, and get that done? Here's the problem. While the Crew Dragon is capable of doing automatic rendezvous and docking, it doesn't have the thrust to throw it around the moon. So it would be basically be a replay of EFT-1, which isn't what we're trying to achieve here. We want to test it around the moon. So then we said, okay, can we, can we use any other kind of upper stage? And, and here's, here's a solution that did work. Uh, a, a Falcon Heavy with a, a regular old Falcon upper stage and an Orion and a European service module. That actually did work on one rocket. Here's the problem. There is a whole host of challenges that had to be addressed. We talk about a, a Falcon uh, being launched, you know, everything is integrated horizontally and then the erector arm makes it vertical. Well, you put an upper stage with a European service module and an Orion on top of that, making it vertical is extremely difficult. It would take a lot of changes uh, to that erector arm. By the way, then, then the, the, the European service module would not have any of the hypergolics on it, so now you have to load the hypergolics in the vertical, which means that the launch pad itself would have huge 
changes that it would need to be that would need to be made. On top of it all, we're talking about putting a massive fairing on top of a, 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 a on top of a Falcon Heavy, and that massive fairing, of course, is going to create some kind of shock wave as it goes through max Q, and those shock waves are going to impact the side boosters on a Falcon Heavy in ways that right now we we don't even know. Which means we got to go back into wind tunnel testing. At the end of the day, while that option was attractive and possible, there was so much risk and so much cost and so much schedule involved that it wouldn't accelerate on either cost or schedule. But here's the thing. It could be used in the future if we could get through all of that. The one downside of that is that it barely made it around the moon. It is true we could get around the moon, but it would be a free return trajectory and there'd be no, no possible way to insert at the moon into an orbit not even a near rectilinear halo orbit, which is, of course, where the gateway would be. So even that capability was limited. That was not the right solution either. I know we're getting short on time, and this is more detail, but I think there's people here that are interested in this. At the end, there is another solution out there, a Falcon Heavy with an ICPS at the top. Talk about strange bedfellows. A Falcon Heavy with an ICPS at the top with, an, with a European service module and Orion crew capsule, that ultimately has the ability to put us to potentially, gosh, Gerst is going to be so mad at me for saying all this. <laughs> but at the end of the day, by the way, none of this was cleared by Gerst and Meyer. He's still the best rocket scientist that we have. Um, no, no insult <laughs> to anybody else in the room. Um, so going, going back to, to, at the end of the day, there, there is a solution here that could potentially work for the future. It would require time, it would require cost, and there is risk involved. But guess what? If we're going to land boots on the moon in 2024, we have time, and we have the ability to accept some risk, make some modifications. All of that is on the table. There is nothing sacred here that is off the table. And that is a, that is a potential capability that could help us land boots on the moon in 2024. I don't want to take away for one second the best option to get us to the lunar orbit as soon as possible is SLS and an Orion with the European service module. There is nothing that beats that capability and right now what we're doing is everything possible to accelerate that. So instead of doing things in series, we're doing things in parallel. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry I'm going to anchor here. We've got some time. We've got 15 more minutes. Here, and by the way, when I went one minute over, when I did the budget rollout, they chopped me off on time. So I'm going to end <laughs> right on time. They just did a hard cutoff. So I'm going to make sure that I don't do that again. Don't go over time on NASA TV. They will cut you off. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're the administrator or not. They're cutting you off. Um, so the SLS and the Orion crew capsule, the European service module is the best solution. We have to accelerate the SLS. How do we make that happen? The engine section ended up in the critical path. That's what happened. The engine section, and everything has to be stacked on top of the engine section. So given the property, plant, and equipment that we had, we were stuck on the engine section, and we can't integrate um, the, the hydrogen tank with the oxygen tank, the inner tank, and the fairings. They couldn't be integrated with the engine section. So what did we do? We just bought hardware that's going to help us integrate horizontally all of those components for an eventual one, so in other words, we can continue working on the rest of the rocket while the engine section is caught in the critical path. That's going to accelerate our schedule by a number of months in a very positive way. Then what we're looking at is ultimately how much testing do we have to do. We don't want to do anything that is absolutely not necessary. There's a lot of tests that we'd like to do, a lot of tests that we would love to see the result of. And we talk about a flight envelope. We want to test it at every single part of that flight envelope in the extreme. Friends, the question is, what, is it, what does it take to be qualified to fly? Not, we don't have to test everything to failure. What does it take to be qualified to fly? Those are the ultimate the questions that we need to answer. And if we can accelerate, whether it's the green run test, um, we have other capabilities. We're talking about space shuttle main engines here. These are RS-25s. They've got millions of seconds of test on top of 130 shuttle flights with three engines each. That's a lot of flight time on these engines. Now they have digital controllers. Digital controllers enable them to, to accept very high off-nominal uh, fluid flows, whether it's liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. So the question is, how much off-nominal can they accept? And it's possible that we could descope some of the green run based on the fact that we now have these new capabilities, digital control, 
which are important. I used to fly airplanes that had digital electronic controls, what we called it, DEC, um, and it made a world of difference. Uh, Again, I'm not saying that an airplane is the same as a rocket. I get it. It's different. And all the rocket engineers are like, yeah, an airplane, whatever. <laughs> but it does help. It makes a big difference. And I think it's important for us to understand that um, it might not be necessary. Again, I'm taking nothing off the table, and we're not going to compromise safety, going back to a previous question. But the question is, what do we need to do? And anything we don't need to do, we can delay. There's future launches, there's future things we can test, but right now, how do we get boots on the moon in 2024? That's our focus. Thanks for the question. Great, we're gonna take one more of the online questions, then we're gonna go to the audience. Um, besides SLS and Orion, what other critical hardware needs to be designed, built and tested for a lunar mission? Um, the gateway, what are our plan, is it the gateway, what are our plans building a lunar lander? Um, it seems we might need one of those pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might need a lander pretty soon. Yes, that is, that is true. Whoever said that, you are correct. In fact, if you could deliver one yesterday, I'd appreciate it. Um, so what, what other hardware needs to be developed? This is, a, I guess, another important point. We're running out of time, and I can't let the clock get me again. Um, so we went through this exercise. Commercially, how do we get to the moon? What we learned is that it's possible, but it's, not, but it's going to take cost, it's going to take schedule, it's going to take a lot of testing, and we're looking at like a 2022, 2023 kind of time frame to be able to insert at the moon commercially. That, that ultimately, if we, if we do all of that and we're able to insert around the moon in 2022, 2023, it's too late. So that needs to happen, quite frankly, in parallel to what we're doing on SLS and Orion. Um, and when we talk about SLS and Orion, there is nothing, even commercially, that can insert into low lunar orbit, which is necessary for us to get some kind of lander on the surface of the moon with humans. SLS, with a, with, even with an exploration upper stage, doesn't get us to that low lunar orbit. What does that mean? That means we've got to get the hardware that, is, that we're already working on, whether it's the power and propulsion element of the gateway, whether it's the habitation module of the gateway. We need to get those on orbit very, very rapidly. And, 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 and guess what? We're on schedule to do that, and we can do that. So we get those elements on orbit quickly. Then, going back to the questioner's question, we need to have three separate stages to get to the lunar surface from the gateway. Why, again, going back to why is the gateway important? We don't have any hardware right now that can get to low lunar orbit apart from the gateway. So we need a transfer vehicle attached to the gateway. We need a descent module attached to the gateway. And when we launch crew on SLS with Orion to the gateway, we need with them an ascent module. Uh, by the way, <laughs> Gerst is going to be so mad. The, <laughs> no, all of this right now is in the, we're looking at it for what is possible to put humans on the moon in 2024. I'm not suggesting that there are not holes here. The reality is we're moving quickly and we're looking at all options and there is nothing off the table. So when we, when we do this, we need to have the gateway with a transfer vehicle that can get us to low lunar, and we need to have a descent module and an ascent module. All of that needs to be launched and put in place around the moon. I told Gerst, I was like, here's what we need to do. We were in a meeting just the other day. I said, we need, a, we need to get an ascent module built quickly, and we need to get it on the surface, and we need to get it pre-positioned on the moon. And he said, we've already got that planned. It's called the gateway. It will be pre-positioned on the gateway. This is evidence that this reusable command and service module is the right architecture for not, a, not just sustainability, but also for speed. You've got to have both. Sustainability, so that this time when we go to the moon, we can actually stay, and speed, we need to get there in 2024. And we have the right architecture right now to accomplish that. Now, certain things are going to have to be descoped, and I get that. We're not building the International Space Station around the moon, as many people would love to do. That's not what we're doing here. The gateway has a purpose. What is its purpose right now? Speed. We want to get to the surface of the moon as soon as possible. We need that ascent module quickly. And by the way, we can leverage existing hardware for transfer vehicles and descent modules, descent modules. We can use existing hardware. But I'm not taking off the table any broad area announcement or any kind of commercial partnership that can help accelerate either one of those. Nothing right now is off the table. But we've got to go fast. If we're going to land in 2024, We've got to be under contract very, very soon. Uh, and that's, that, that is just 
the, the ground truth reality of what we're up against. Great. We'll take a question from the audience. Hi, Margaret Roberts. I'm in the legal office. Hey, Margaret. Um, when we're thinking about boots on the ground, I'm just wondering, would the crew that we would see be two people? Is that what we would see? And then also, um, would the vice president's uh, direction allow for two women <laughs> and Great. not a man? And would we have, are we designing suits that are small? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So Maybe twins. <laughs> there you go. Uh, number one, there are different architectures that we have been kicking around for the last week. And um, it is true that one of those architectures could be a two-person descent module and a two-person ascent module. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, the goal here is a sustainable return to the moon where we can get to more parts of the moon than ever before. I honestly like a two-person module because then you can send two people to one side of the moon and two people to the other side of the moon and have multiple missions going on at the same time. Again, the gateway being that reusable command and service module that it is enables us to do those kind of activities that before were not even imagined. So that's a positive thing. Um, it, but again, we're assessing what do we need to do to get humans on the surface of the moon soonest. I think that two-person uh, ascent module might be the right solution. Um, but if other people have different ideas on how to go faster, we'll certainly look at that. As far as suits, the answer is absolutely. The vice president was clear. The next man and the first woman on the moon will be the United States from the United States of America. And we will build everything according to making that a reality. Yep. Great. So um, another one of the more popular questions we have online. Over the past 15 years, the agency has been directed to go to the Mars, then the moon, then an asteroid, then the asteroid around the moon, then Mars, then the space station around the moon, and now the moon again. What steps do you plan to take to reduce the programmatic whiplash that takes us from actually accomplishing any of these grand plans? What assurances can be given that this plan for lunar return will survive a change in administration after the 2020 election? How can we protect our long-term human space flight plans from rapid changes like these? Oh man, a lot in there. So the answer is, um, one of the things that I did when I was in the House of Representatives is we voted on the NASA Transition Authorization Act, which made sure that we kept a constancy of purpose mm -hmm. going from one administration to the next administration. So Congress has a role to play here that has been very successful in the past. It hasn't always, um, Congress hasn't always been successful in doing that, but in this particular case, there was bipartisan support for keeping a continuity of purpose. And because of that, we now have these options available to us. But this questioner is exactly right. If we throw out all of the things that we're doing right now and start with a clean slate, number one, we're never going to get to the moon in 2024, and number two, it won't be sustainable, which are the two objectives right now. So um, Congress has a role to play here, but I think the other thing that's important is when you have administration support that is saying this is going to be accomplished potentially while we are still in office, that's the level of certainty that has not existed in the past. Um, I will also say that this is not a political or a partisan thing at all. Um, you know, the people, people say, you know, John F. Kennedy got us to the moon. Well, it's Richard Nixon's name on that plate on the surface of the moon because he was in office when the event actually happened. Um, so th this is not political or partisan. This is about achieving something and having people held accountable to those achievements um, during the time in which they serve, including me. Guys, that's on me, right? I have to achieve this. We as an agency have to achieve this, and I think it's good leadership. Um, so I, I think, uh, I don't think we're going to be cast to and fro on this one. <laughs> I think we're going to go to the moon in 2024. And by the way, we talk about bipartisan support. We have to have it. This can't be, this can't be a one party only kind of agenda, and I'll tell you why. Because when you think about the budgets coming up, um, there's a high probability that we're going to end up in a continuing resolution. And if we end up in a continuing resolution, it makes it very difficult to achieve what we're trying to achieve. We can't get a new ascent module under a continuing resolution. We can't get a descent module under a continuing, we can't get to the surface of the moon under a continuing resolution, which means we have to have as an agency an anomaly to the Commerce Justice Science Appropriation Bill. Well, that anomaly needs bipartisan support or it's not gonna pass. This is not a partisan or a political thing. Um, nobody knows what the, what the world is going to look like in 2024. All we know is that we have an agenda to get to the moon in 2024. Great. We have time for one more question. Anyone from the audience? Thank you.
think you've done such a great job. You've answered everyone's questions. There's got to be another question out there. <laughs> well, we have uh, lots of questions online. Okay. Um, here's one. Besides being given the mandate to just go to the moon, or what are the goals for the first crew that lands there to accomplish on the lunar surface? Okay, so we go to the moon for a number of reasons. Number one, we need to prove technology. We need to retire risk. We need to build the capabilities ultimately to go to Mars. The moon is the proving ground. So it's a, a technology demonstration. It's a technology development kind of mission to begin with. We also, under Space Policy Directive 1, need to start utilizing the resources of the moon, namely the water ice. So we need to learn how to live and work on another world. That's what the moon is all about. Why? Because when we go to Mars, you're going to be there for two years because there are only, Mars is aligned on the same side of the sun as the Earth once every 26 months, which means we have to, when we go there, be ready to live and work there for a period of time uh, of, of two years. So that puts us in a position to utilize the moon as this proving ground for an eventual human spaceflight capability to Mars. But between now and then, we need to characterize the water ice and uh, ultimately uh, achieve the, the technology demonstration and the establishment of presence at the valuable, uh, por uh, the valuable parts of the, the south pole of the moon. If you think about what, what does that mean, established presence? There are key areas of the south pole of the moon that are tremendously valuable. Those key areas are where the volatiles are, it's where the water is, but also the peaks of eternal light, um, areas where the sun really doesn't set because of the, the craters at the south pole. Maybe it does set, but it sets for a very short period of time, and then it comes back up. In other words, you've got solar power available um, for long periods of time, if not indefinitely. So you've got those cold traps that are the craters with water ice, and at the poles, those cold traps also have almost permanent sunlight. Those are the valuable regions of the moon that we need to get to, and ultimately establishing a presence there is a part of this mission. Great. Well, I, uh, I know we've got about a couple minutes left. I just, I, I want to reiterate, um, this is a big charge, and it comes straight from the top. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for all of us to achieve this. And if we can pull it off, and I'm not saying if, when we pull it off, it's going to be something that all of us can share with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Just like today, you don't know how many people I talk to who are involved in the Apollo era. In fact, some people even still here today. Gersten Meyer. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. He's not going to be happy with me after this. <laughs> but um, but, but this, is, this is a big moment. I think we need to embrace it. We need to go full force after this objective with everything we have, make it a reality. And, and at the end, I think all of us are going to um, have an amazing story to tell our children and our grandchildren. So... Thank you for all your time today, and I look forward to more dialogue. If you have more questions, of course, you can send them to the communications staff, and we'll do what we can to answer them. So thank you so much.